Hi, my name is Henry Story, and today I'd like to speak about the social network mess and why we need the social web. Let's start with a story, that of um, Robert Scobo, uh, who was um, uh, very important at getting Microsoft to open up. Um, in 2007, or before he, uh, and before perhaps already, he enthusiastically endorsed Facebook, uh, getting a lot of friends, he, uh, well, first creating an account, um, then uh, finding friends by perhaps entering his email, uh, his email address, um, and uh, Facebook there just, uh, just fetches emails once it's got a password from uh, one of your accounts and extracts the um, email addresses of the people you're communicating with, and uses those then to uh, find people already on the network. In any case, he made a lot of friends, wrote a lot about it, and towards the end of 2000, he wanted to extract this uh, list um, of his acquaintances, um, I think in order to bring it to, over to Plaxo and to his local, uh, local uh, address book. But uh, this led uh, to his account being disabled. Um, Facebook has a number of uh, agents that monitor uh, usage, and uh, they uh, disabled him his account for suspicious activity. He put forward a, a video uh, try, uh, where he told his friends about this, and because he was influential, this led to uh, the data portability movement, which came up with the following video, which explains the current social networking problems very well. So let's look at it. You log into Facebook, Gmail, Twitter, YouTube, Delicious. You log into LinkedIn, WordPress, Ustream, Utters. Jaiku, and that's just the morning. Then you have to maintain your accounts. You create a profile, and another profile, and another profile. Adding your contact details, adding your friends. Adding your contact details, adding your friends. Adding your contact details, you get the message. Great, there goes half your life. Now, time to add some media. Upload your photos, your avatars, your videos, your music, rinse and repeat, again, and again, and again. Net result? Network fatigue. Your data locked up in someone else's hands. Anyway, Scoble got his account back soon afterwards. Um, uh, others have not had that luck. Um, perhaps this picture here explains uh, best uh, what the problem is. We have a number of little, uh, uh, we have many and growing number of social networks, each acting as data silos, uh, which do not communicate, making it very difficult for um, uh, people to uh, join, uh, move from one network to the other. Um, so. At the end of the video, there was a short uh, section that said, your data in someone else's hands. Let's develop this notion a little bit. Um, here is a, a Facebook page, this is mine. Um, I can see information about myself, uh, posts by my friends. Um, I have a limited view of the graph, uh, the social graph. Um, we can think of what we see in a network as uh, a number of relations presented to us in HTML. The social network on itself, uh, by itself, though, sees everything. Um, it sees not just my relations and my friends' relations, but their friends' relation, everybody on the network, which in the case of uh, um, Facebook is around 400 million, uh, 500 million accounts, perhaps 350 million people. Now, this is uh, very similar to the panopticon that was uh, proposed uh, by Jeremy Bentham as a system uh, for guarding prisoners with very little uh, manpower. Essentially, the system is, uh, works like this. You have uh, a number of guards in a tower um, in the center of, a, of, of an open prison uh, where the guards cannot be seen, but the prisoners are completely visible. This allows a very small number of guards to uh, watch a huge number of prisoners, since none of the prisoners at any time know if they're being watched or not. So they have to consistently, intern uh, co uh, constantly internalize 
the, inter the gaze, the possible gaze of the um, guards. Um, now, is this a problem? Well, uh, only if you can't leave. And um, we might ask, uh, is data portability enough to allow one to leave? You can take your info with you, your um, addresses perhaps, uh, recently now your email too, your photos, your memories, but you can't take your friends. Uh, you have to convince each of your friends. But even if you convince all of your friends, which would be very unlikely, you'd have to convince their friends too. Because what's so interesting about these social networks isn't just the people you see, but the people you aren't quite yet in touch with. So what's the point to leave in any case if it's just to enter another network that has similar rules? Let's look at a system that works differently, the telephone. In a, um, when, you have, when you get a telephone um, number, you join a network. And this network allows you to call anyone in the world, whatever network they're part of. Someone in BT can call someone in AT&T. In fact, you can switch uh, networks in some European countries and keep the same number, and all your uh, friends won't even know about it. A telephone number is a globally unique identifier. This is mine. Another example is email addresses. With email, uh, you can send messages to the whole world. Uh, whatever organization your contact belongs to. Mine is uh, henry.story at bblfish.net. Feel free to send me email if you have questions about this. Another example is uh, the World Wide Web. When you uh, buy a domain, mine is bblfish.net, um, and you can buy one too. Then you have a system that looks a little bit like this. Everybody has um, a, a domain name, a machine, perhaps a virtual machine on some cloud storage. And on that uh, machine, you can set up a web server. On that web server, you can set up documents. And each of these documents uh, gets a URL too. So the machines have URLs. The documents have URLs that are global, unique names, a bit like the telephone numbers uh, or the email addresses. And you can send them to their friends, and they can uh, uh, click on them. Or they can publish them in a newspaper or place them on buses. Some of these um, uh, documents can be protected so that only certain people uh, can see them. You see this in banks or online commerce law. The semantic web allows us to go further than this. It allows us in those documents to describe real-world objects using URLs too. These documents can also be protected. So, for example, here we have Juliet.name. Um, we have uh, a document on there in which we just uh, name Juliet, uh, who has a relation to her name and her relation to her friend and uh, her bank account, perhaps. Romeo has his uh, domain name and a link, um, perhaps a faux nose link or some kind of specialized link to Juliet. With a semantic web, we can describe relations across um, domains, which is what we were looking for. Now, if we're going to have hundreds of friends, as we people now currently have on the social networking sites, we're going to have um, each with their own servers. We're going to have a real problem uh, with login. Because if each time you log in, uh, you get a new friend, you have to go to their site uh, create a new username and password and fill in your friends and you have hundreds of friends and each uh, so that would be 300 accounts say if you have 300 friends for you each of your friends would have to do the same thing 300 times each one would have to create a new username and a new password because if they use the same password everybody uh, would be able to pretend they're them um, um, it's clearly completely infeasible so we need to solve that problem and we have Here's a demo of it. Come to a site that is uh, Web ID enabled. Uh, click the login button. The server asks the browser to ask us for our certificate. We choose one of them. And um, this is sent back to the server, identifying us. And all the information about it is already available. No username, no password, one click login. Uh, and in future talks, we'll go into more detail about how that works. Um, thank you for listening.